Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for all Thy manifold blessings to us, coming to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for this Thy Word, and that Thou hast given us Thy Spirit to guide us into all truth, which is to say, to give us a full orb understanding, a comprehensive understanding of the Scripture, of the Gospel, of that which delivers us from not only the guilt of sin, objectively speaking, but also from the dominion of sin. And so we pray that thou wouldst revive thy church, that thou wouldst uh, cause thy ministers to speak this day, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. We pray that this gospel of the kingdom would go throughout all the earth as a witness unto all nations because then and then only will the end come. We pray that we would be delivered from the coming persecution at least in our day and we pray for a mighty multiplication of thy people because thou dost save thy people in the line of continued generations. We pray now that thou wouldst cause us to learn what thou wouldst have us know through this person Thy servant, Samson, who is an eminent example not only of the faith which is taught in thy word, but of the same faith which thou hast vouchsafed unto us, thy people. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Hebrews 11, 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. I've been thinking of what we should title this sermon, and I think I came up with one. Um, well, let's read the passage first. Judges chapter 15 Beginning with verse 14. And when he, meaning Samson, came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands, and he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, With the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi. And he was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. Note carefully what he calls these people. These Philistines, he calls them not Philistines, but the hand of the uncircumcised. But God clave in hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name thereof En Hakori, which is in Lehi unto this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines. Twenty years. Two weeks ago, we, uh, in our title of the sermon, well, our title of the sermon was a play on words. It was entitled, um, Might and Main. M-A-N-E. There's a saying in English that a person does something with all his might and M-A-I-N, meaning he conjures up all his strength to perform 
whatever task he is about to do. And the purpose of this title, Might and M-A-N-E, was both to emphasize something and to clear up a common misconception. In the Southern Baptist Church, which is my background, they teach uh, truly, yet indirectly, they don't teach anything directly, but they teach that Samson's strength was in his hair. And this cannot be true because um, his strength was a spiritual strength. And hair belongs, as we know, to the natural realm. Samson's strength was a strength which came from God. And as we hope to see once again today, it came not from the natural realm, but from the spiritual realm. His strength was not in his hair, but it was in his faith. Though Samson was the strongest man, perhaps, who ever lived on the face of the earth, he never won an Olympic weightlifting contest or a powerlifting meet. The purpose of his strength was not to kill physical men, though he at one time killed, as we just saw in our text. He killed single-handedly 1,000 men with something as insignificant as the jawbone of an ass. And so how strong was he? Has it ever happened before, we ask? And I think it's probably not possible that it ever happened before or since, that a person single-handedly killed a thousand men. But the purpose of Samson's strength was not to kill physical men, as we hope to see by a parallel passage in 1 Samuel 18, 27, and the context of this passage is King Saul and David. First Samuel eighteen twenty seven. Let's begin with verse twenty five. And Saul said. Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry for the hand of his daughter. He was offering the hand of his daughter to David in marriage. The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, It pleased David. Well, to be the king's son-in-law. He wasn't bothered at all at the stipulation of the dowry, and the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew the Philistines, 200 men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. And so... Saul um, stipulated that for David to have his daughter's hand in marriage, he must produce 100 foreskins from the Philistines. And it is no coincidence that this is the same ethnicity with which Samson fought. Saul commanded David, though not directly, to kill a hundred Philistines as the stipulation for him to take the hand of his daughter in marriage. And uh, why is this significant, we ask the question, and why is it parallel to this passage regarding Samson? And it is so because it shows not only that Samson's strength was not in his hair, because... Um, hair, as we just said, hair belongs to the natural realm. Samson's strength was a spiritual strength. And the purpose of the stipulation of the foreskins was the same principle that we see in Samson. Um, because the foreskin was the one thing, the one physical thing which 
distinguish the physical Israelites from the physical Philistines. And we believe in what is known as covenant theology, which is something at one and the same time so important in all of the Bible and something which the church in our day has all but totally forgotten. And so when any text even smells of this concept, I consider it incumbent upon myself to bring it out as clearly as I possibly can. The probably the most important, the most, uh, the clearest verse in all of Scripture teaching this concept of God's covenant from which we derive what is known as covenant theology is Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. Genesis Genesis 17, verse 7, and I hope that all of you have already memorized this verse, and if you haven't, that you will indeed memorize it because it is so important. I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and I seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And so the question is, how does this verse and how does covenant theology relate both to David's situation and to Samson? If we look at the verse three verses later, in Genesis 17 verse 10, we see this. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Notice carefully. He says, this is my covenant. And you see the colon. Or semicolon. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And so, God is not telling him that circumcision is an important aspect of the covenant, but no, carefully, he says, this is my covenant. Circumcision is my covenant. And since it is so important in the Old Testament, this concept of circumcision, it cannot possibly, because it's, this is his covenant. His covenant is an everlasting covenant. And he says, circumcision is my covenant. It cannot possibly this concept, have disappeared, as the Baptists try to tell us, in the New Testament after the resurrection of Christ. And Paul tells us in the New Testament that, that this concept has not disappeared. This concept of circumcision being the covenant, not only a part of the covenant, but it is in a very real sense. The covenant. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, which we keep going back to. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but this was the very first verse from which the very first sermon of Great Commission Presbyterian Church was preached. And interestingly enough, it wasn't Great Commission Presbyterian Church at the time because I was in the process of leaving the Baptist, my Baptist mindset, which if you look at this verse carefully, I couldn't possibly have had a Baptist. Why would I start with this verse? We are the circumcision, Philippians 3.3, 3, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Notice Paul did not say we are the people of God though that is exactly what he meant. We are the people of God because the people of God what is a better description of the people of God other than the fact that they worship God the Father rejoicing in Christ Jesus through whom there is access and access alone to the Father and there is access to the Father through Christ by the Spirit What's a more accurate description of the people of God than this? What we find in Philippians 3.3, 3, but Paul didn't say we're the people of God. He said we're the circumcision. Once again, you see the concept. 
in a very real sense. Circumcision is not a part of being the people of God. It is the people of God. We are the circumcision in the back of Genesis 17.10 so we don't miss the parallel. We are the circumcision and then he says, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you in thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. My covenant is circumcision and I would be remiss if I did not explain how it is that circumcision not only is a part of the covenant but can be said to be the covenant. This is a part of speech in English which is called a synecdoche. This term had to be coined by Calvinists because it sounds so sophisticated but it's a very simple concept. What is synecdoche? Synecdoche is a part of speech wherein a part of something is used to refer to the whole. See how simple it is. For example, I might say, I'm not going to use cash to pay for this item. I'm going to use my plastic. See, plastic can't purchase anything. But when we say plastic, we frequently mean a credit card because plastic is the part of the credit card which you can see and feel with your hands. Or we might say, we have boots on the ground in Afghanistan. We're not talking about boots, we're talking about soldiers. But boots, or every soldier has boots, though boots don't fight in battle. We're using a part of something to refer to the whole. This is called a synecdoche, and so we have in Philippians 3, 3, we are the circumcision. Circumcision is a synecdoche, using a part of something to refer to the whole. Give me 100 foreskins. Saul commanded David. The foreskin represented. It was a part of the Philistine representing the whole. And so we see the importance of this concept that circumcision is the covenant. And it couldn't possibly have disappeared. And as an aside, um, once again, because of my Baptist background and many of our backgrounds have either been Baptist backgrounds or been highly influenced by the Baptists. We're not reluctant to mention this part of the body because it is not something that is unclean, but it is only unclean if it is abused. I remember my uh, professor in Christian ethics class in seminary. This is, isn't it strange how you remember certain un insignificant things and other things more important you forget totally. But I remember one day in class he, he made this statement. He said, there is nothing wrong with relations. Of course he didn't use the word relations, but he put himself on trial by that statement. How so? Because who but a Baptist, who but a Baptist could think that there is anything that could possibly be anything wrong with conjugal relations but he had to say it there's nothing wrong with conjugal relations how is this related to baptists here's how it's related to baptists because baptists believe that sin is in things back to david and samson david not only produced 100 foreskins but he produced 200 but David did not kill physical persons. He killed, as Samson did before him, the spiritual enemies of God. And this is a necess necessary distinction and not a distinction without a difference. That though he killed physical people, this is a, a main part of our message today, so pay close attention. Though Samson killed physical people, he was in fact, destroying the enemies of God. That's why Samson is noted for his faith. Just as we said, Samson's hair, Samson's strength was not in his hair. And so he used the jawbone of an ass not to kill physical men so much, but to kill the spiritual enemies 
of God. Just as David did not merely destroy 200 Philistines, but he destroyed the enemies of God. And as another aside on our text, the place where this took place, that Samson killed a thousand enemies of God with a jawbone of an ass. The place where it took place is called Lehi. And if you look that word up, the meaning, the etymology of the word Lehi is jawbone. Isn't that interesting? And here's why it's interesting to me. Because, well, I don't pretend to know the whole of why it was called Lehi, but at least we can go this far. This place where the incident took place was called Jawbone long before Samson came along and killed the enemies of God with a jawbone of an ass. And the significance was that it was named Lehi so that at a later date, a man who apart from the grace of God was no better than an ass could kill 1,000 of God's enemies with an ass of a jawbone, with the jawbone of an ass. The church has all but forgotten this concept. And it has almost completely disappeared. What concept are we talking about? The concept that the reprobate, God's enemies, exist for the purpose of the elect. And the church, I say, has taken for granted that the opposite of this is the case in our generation. Whether it be the, 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 the liberal facet or aspect of the church, the evangelical church, or the, Cath or the Calvinist church, all forgotten this concept and believe the very opposite of it. And what is the principle that is taught in the church today which, which is antithetical to this concept that God saves his people through the destruction of his enemies. The opposite concept is that God doesn't have any enemies. And when we speak, when we say the enemies of God, we're not talking about uh, people who hate God, but let's look at James 4.4 4 to get a clear understanding of what we're trying to say. It was James, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Ye James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It doesn't say you're God's enemy doesn't say God is your enemy. It says you're God's enemy. The friendship of the world is enmity. Is the, whosoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. God is your enemy. God has enemies. God, the Christian church today believes that God doesn't hate anyone. Though we're clearly told in Romans chapter 7 verse 13 that this is the case. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And so we believe that passages such as this are not to be explained, but are to be explained away. And there's an attack on this principle that Samson didn't merely kill men, but he killed the enemies of God. And furthermore, uh, this principle is not only hated in other words, the idea is not so much that they oppose, that the church opposes the fact that God um, kills people because they are sinners, but even more so. Let's look at Romans 9, 13, and look at two verses before that. Romans 9, 13, saying that Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated Two verses earlier, it says, For the children, Jacob and Esau, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, 
but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elders shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated the children, being not born, neither having done any good or evil. Which tells us that God hated, which is to say, he rejected Esau. He received Jacob and rejected Esau before any of, before either of the two of them had been born or done any good or evil. In other words, he didn't, he didn't receive Jacob because of his good works and he didn't reject Esau because of his bad works. It was before they had either done any, he saw them, he saw one in Adam, he saw the other outside of Adam. And this place, Lehi, teaches us this concept that the whole creation exists so that because this place is named to Lehi before, this is named Jawbone before Samson ever arrived on the scene with a jawbone. It is there to teach us that the whole of creation exists in order to be the stage on which God's drama of redemption takes place. Psalm 145.10 is an excellent ex expression of this. Psalm 145.10 All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. Notice carefully the word praise and the word bless mean exactly the same thing, but it's a completely different word. They're synonyms. You can imagine the psalmist David writing this out and even maybe changing his writing utensil when he comes to the next word for praise. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. And from a particular standpoint, Samson's purpose was so important because this principle, you cannot, if you read the Old Testament with any understanding whatsoever, you can't miss this principle. But Baptists are trained not to see it, even though it permeates the Holy Old Testament. And this proves beyond any shadow of doubt that Samson's strength was not in his hair, but was in his faith. And the Baptists taught me that, once again indirectly, that the greatest mistake that the, Philip, the Philistines ever made was they forgot to keep Samson's hair cut short, which is a total denial of the text, because this would only be true if Samson only destroyed physical persons, which was not the case. And all of the Bible teaches this principle. You've seen the Baptist pictures in the storybooks and the Sunday school quarterlies of Samson having bulging muscles. But this, I believe, to be a clear error, according to the principle taught us in 2 Corinthians Four seven. What does Samson look like? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The antithesis, you see that? We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And what treasure is he speaking of? If we look at the previous verse, which once again we perhaps quote more than any other verse. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of it. This is the treasure. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ because this is faith. We have this treasure of faith in earthen vessels. So if, if Samson had bulging muscles, that would have been counterintuitive, as they say, would it not have been? Because the lesson to be taught was that Samson's strength was in his faith, not in his physical structure. I don't think there was ever a lock of Samson's hair 
cut off and put into a jar so that we could worship it. No, the treasure is the faith which God gave him and the faith which God gives us, which is our power. And so, since Samson is a representative of all of our strength, which resided in his faith and resides in our faith, Samson's story tells us this one thing that we just mentioned briefly above, and that is the life of the Christian is a life of warfare. And since the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're dealing with the Old Testament, obviously, with Samson. There is no clean break between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Samson's life was a life of warfare. Our life is a life of warfare. We'll say once again that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The New Testament is latent in the Old and the Old Testament is patent in the New. The Old Testament is shadow. The New Testament is substance. In the Old Testament, the warfare of the Christian was indeed, as Samson teaches us, was indeed spiritual. And yet it had a physical aspect of it. But in the New Testament, the physical aspect, the natural aspect of the warfare has disappeared. I was reminded this week that a certain person who calls himself Reformed said that cessationists, a cessationist is a person, a cessationist as opposed to a continuationist. A cessationist is a person who believes that the, the New Testament miracles have disappeared. This so-called Reformed Theologian said that if you claim to be, if you are a cessationist, if you believe that the New Testament miracles no longer exist, then you're not a Christian. You see the relationship we're dealing with. The physical has disappeared for the sake of the spiritual. Whereas the physical with respect to warfare and in general and Samson's warfare in particular, we say that it was spiritual warfare, but it has a, it had a natural concomitant because he killed physical people. Second Corinthians 10. We quote this quite a bit also, do we not? Second Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. You see that? The uh, contrast. The weapons of our warfare are not, do not in any sense belong to the natural realm, as in a sense they did with respect to Samson. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience, the obedience of Christ. Imaginations, which is the concept of sophistry. Arguments which on their surface seem to be plausible but are illogical when examined further. And so Samson teaches us this all-important concept of the warfare of the Christian. And we do not learn this at our own peril. Another misconception that we need to clear up is that both in the story of Samson and the story of David, there are the so called good guy and the bad guy, the good guys and the bad guys. Uh, there are people that God loves and there are people that God hates. There are people that God blesses and the people that God curses. But the concept is not this. 
that there are good guys and bad guys, and thank God we're the good guys. There are people that God loves and people God hates, and, I, and thank God that we're the people that God loves. There are people that God blesses and people that God curses, and I'm thankful that I'm of the first category. And just as with the concept of faith and justification, the point to be made is the relationship between the two. The relationship between faith and justification. We're speaking here of the relationship between God's elect, meaning the Israelites and God's and the and the reprobate, which were in the case of Samson, the Philistines. The relationship between the two. Not just the fact that God loves some people and he hates other people. By the way, let me read this. Because I just forgot to read it. We were just looking at, speaking of this concept, we were looking at Romans 9.13. Listen to this exposition, perhaps the best commentary ever written on the book of Romans. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It may be asked why God hated him, which is to say Esau, before he sinned personally, as we just read from Romans 9, 11, the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. It may be asked why God hated him before he sinned personally. And human wisdom has proved its folly by endeavoring to soften the word hate into something less than hatred. But the man who submits like a little child of the word of God will find no difficulty in seeing in what sense Esau was worthy of the hatred of God before he was born. He sinned in Adam and was therefore properly an object of God's hatred as well as fallen Adam was. There is no other view that will ever account for this language and this treatment of Esau. By nature, too, he was a wicked creature, conceived in sin, although his faculties were not expanded or his innate depravity developed, which God, who hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and hardeneth whom he will, and who giveth no account of his matters, did not see good to counteract by his grace as in the case of Jacob, who originally was equally wicked and by nature, like Esau, a child of wrath and a fit object of hatred. Nothing, he says, can more clearly manifest the strong opposition of the human mind to the doctrine of the divine sovereignty than the violence which human ingenuity has employed to wrest the expression Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. By many this has been explained. Esau have I loved less. But Esau was not the object of any degree of the divine love. And the word hate never signifies to love less. The occurrence of the word in that expression, hate father and mother, Luke 14, 26, has been alleged in vindication of this explanation. In other words, hate. If a man come after me and hateth not his father and mother, they use this to say, look, hatred doesn't mean hatred in this expression. But the word in this last phrase is used figuratively and in a manner that cannot be mistaken. Although hatred is not meant to be asserted, yet hatred is a thing that is literally expressed by a strong figure of speech. If any man come after me and hateth not his father and mother, by a strong figure of speech, that is called hatred which resembles it in its effects. We will not obey those whom we hate if we can avoid it. Just so, if our parents command us to disobey Jesus Christ, we must not obey them. And this is called hatred figuratively from the resemblance of its effects. But in this passage, in which the expression, Esau have I hated, occurs, everything is literal. The apostle is reasoning from premises to a conclusion. Besides, the contrast of loving Jacob with hating Esau shows that the last phrase is literal and proper hatred. If God's love to Jacob was real, literal love, God's hatred to Esau must be real, literal hatred. It might as well be said that the phrase Jacob have I love does not signify that God really loved Jacob, but that to love here signifies only to hate less. 
And that all that is meant by the expression is that God hated Jacob less than he hated Esau. So we see the importance of this concept. And we're talking about the relationship, not just the fact that there are some who are the objects of God's love, there are others who are objects of God's hatred, but the relationship between the two is what we want to concentrate on, just as it is important with respect to faith and justification. We said the false gospel, the similarity between the false gospel and the true gospel is that both hold to the necessity of faith to justification. However, the difference between them lies in the relationship of the two. The false gospel says the relationship of faith to salvation or justification is that God accepts us on the basis of our faith, because of our faith. The true gospel says that the relationship between faith and salvation is that through faith which the Holy Spirit works in us, Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to us. And so the basis of our acceptance with God is not any action on our part, including our belief in the gospel, but the basis and the meritorious ground of our justification is the work of Christ and the righteousness of Christ. And so, with respect to the elect and the reprobate, the relationship between the two is that God saves his people through the destruction of the reprobate. And so we see that faith and Samson's faith, as well as our faith, this is the victory that overcometh the world. You see, in the physical sense in the Old Testament, but there was only a physical sense. The real fight has always been a spiritual fight against the enemies of God. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And the victory that overcame the world of the Philistines in Samson's time was his faith. But you see, the fact that faith is our fighting mechanism presupposes the fact that we must have something to fight. You see the relationship between the elect and the reprobate. There is a war, a spiritual warfare. And the object of our contention, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, we're told in Jude, the third verse. Faith is always spiritual. But in the Old Testament, it had a physical concomitant. Samson fought the Philistines, but the real battle was a spiritual battle. And so, let's give some examples so that we can understand this more clearly. It's not only the fact that God elects some and reprobates others, but that the reprobate exists for the purpose of the elect. God saves his people through the destruction of the wicked, which we see. The next time you read through the Old Testament, keep this in the back of your mind and you will see it again and again and again. That's how important it is. And if you don't get this, you will miss a lot in the Old Testament. And how important is this? The devil has produced the false gospel so that we will miss this. In other words, the false gospel tells us, basically, that God has no enemies. He loves everybody. He loves them and desires their salvation. I talked to a guy yesterday. He saw something I put up online that we have translated certain works into the Chinese language and he wanted me to participate in the translation of something that he was interested in. And I looked on his page and I saw that he was a former OPC pastor and so I asked him, what do you think of John Murray's free offer of the gospel? And he re resorted, immediately he resorted to paradox. Yeah, there's some, things that, there's some things in the Bible that we don't quite understand, such as how did Christ weep over Jerusalem? What was he saying? 
that there was a real sense in which Christ loves everybody. Such is nothing. That's the false gospel. See how it militates against the idea in our text. Noah, in Noah's day, God saved his people through the destruction of those he hated. The destruction of the reprobate. And even the rain, as we just saw, this place was named Lehi, which means jawbone, because Samson was to come there and use a jawbone. In the future, when it was named Lehi, Samson wasn't around. So that God would save his people through the destruction of the wicked. That's how important this is. The entire creation, in a very real sense, exists in order to demonstrate this fact. That's how important it is. The same rain in Noah's day, which destroyed the wicked, buoyed the elect to safety. And then the second instance is the instance... This is how important this is. It occurs. I haven't yet looked through the Bible to see just how many times it does occur, but it occurs, as you know, again and again and again and again. And and that's the instance of the deliverance of God's people from Egypt. It's referred back to time and time, and it cannot be but of supreme importance. And what transpired? What was the last plague? That God saved his people through the blood of the Lamb over the doorpost and through, as it turned out, the destruction of Pharaoh's army. But this was not a mere physical destruction, but was a spiritual one. Isaiah 53, 3 tells us this wonderful principle that you cannot miss and you miss at your own peril of this Christian warfare which had a physical concomitant in the Old Testament though that physical concomitant has disappeared in the New Testament. Isaiah 43, 3 For I am the Lord thy God the Holy One of Israel thy Savior I gave Egypt for thy ransom Ethiopia and Seba before thee. Egypt existed in the mind of God to one purpose and one purpose alone, because God's people had to have something to fight so that God could show to us that he delivers his people. He saves his people through the destruction of the wicked. In conclusion, this principle that Samson here teaches us at Lehi with the jawbone of an ass, with this physical concomitant, killing the physical Philistines, as David killed the physical Philistines afterwards, 200 of them, teaches us this all-important concept that we can't miss, that God saves his people through the destruction of our enemies, of his enemies. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. He's not your enemy. No, that's true. You're his enemy if you love the world. And as we just said, the natural concept has disappeared in the New Testament. The natural element destroying physical Philistines. But the same principle obtains. There is a difference regarding this principle, as we just said. There is no more physical element in the New Testament, but the warfare still obtains. And we close with this verse that we just quoted a few minutes ago, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare, that's taken for granted, are not carnal, but mighty. Through the Through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, sophistry, which is what we're doing on a day-to-day basis, are we not? Casting down sophistry, calling contradiction paradox and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought under the obedience of Christ. So Samson, 
And David teach us as 2 Corinthians 10 does, that the Christian life is a life of warfare. The Israelites in the Old Testament took the land through conquest. Secondly, Samson's strength and our strength, as 2 Corinthians 10 tells us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Samson's strength was not in his hair, but was in his faith. That's why he's mentioned in Hebrews 11, because Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. Thirdly, though unlike Samson, we do not kill our enemies physically, yet we do destroy them. What is 2 Corinthians? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. There are two, before we get to this, though, let's look at, uh, because it says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. This word carnal sometimes means the mind, the carnal mind is enmity against God, but it doesn't mean that we believe in this case. It means something else. At, uh, Romans 15, verse 27. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, in other words, the Jews took the gospel to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were made partakers of spiritual truth, which was proclaimed to them by the Jews. Their duty, which is to say the duty of the Gentiles, is also to minister to them in carnal things. You see that? In things in the natural realm, such as money, clothing, etc. And so the weapons of our warfare are not from the natural realm, but the spiritual realm. Our two major enemies with which we fight, one attacks, as we said before, and we're going to review it. One of our major enemies attacks justification, and that is called legalism. Legalism says that we can be justified by works. We said legalism is a false concept of strength. That's why we call it the enemy on the right. A false, because our right side represents our strength. A false concept of strength. And we destroy legalism, this enemy, through proclaiming the law. Because the law drives the elect sinner to despair of any strength that he has. Genesis 6, 5 says that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Or 2 Corinthians 12, Now my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in showing you your complete and utter weakness. The law drives us to the propitiation of Christ as our only hope. To deliver us from this objective state of the guilt of sin. So you see our enemy on the right attacks the concept of, is it any accident? These two most important concepts in Christianity. That Adam fell into an objective state of the guilt of sin. Our enemy on the right seeks to destroy this concept of justification. See, By saying we don't need to be delivered from objective guilt. See, Because we are strong and we can be accepted through our own works and so that enemy is destroyed through the proclamation of the law driving us to total despair of any strength that we might have our second major enemy first major enemy attacks justification through denying the guilt of sin our second major enemy attacks this second most important concept in Christianity of sanctification. We must be delivered objectively from the guilt of sin. And then we must be delivered subjectively from the dominion of sin. Antinomianism attacks 
sanctification because antinomianism says that since we're justified, since we're not justified by works, then works is a false inference. Since we're, since we're not justified works by works, meaning that we are unable, see, that's why antinomianism is much, at least in my view, it's much more dangerous than legalism because it's much more insidious because it starts with the truth. We're not justified by works because we are not only weak, we're weakness. But the false inference is that therefore works in the life of the Christian are not necessary. And antinomian, antinomianism like legalism is destroyed through the proclamation of the law. The law solves the problem not only of the guilt of sin by driving us to the propitiation of Christ as our only hope, but the law also solves the problem of the dominion of sin because proclaiming the law subjectively reconciles us to the law, to obedience to the law, solving this problem. As Augustine said, when Adam fell, we fell in him. We fell under the dominion of sin, meaning that we cannot but sin. Lastly, since this warfare is the warfare of faith, how does faith come in? We go right back to what we're dealing with in Galatians 5, 6, do we not? For neither circumcision, let's look back at it. Galatians 5, 6, neither circumcision availeth anything. nor uncircumcision. God doesn't accept you if you're a Jew on the basis of your ethnicity. But that's what you tend to think if you only look at physical circumcision. See that? Physical concomitant. Now that has disappeared and we're left with the spiritual and spiritual alone. In the New Testament, neither circumcision avails anything. Oh, well, then uncircumcision must avail. See, these guys were so bad that God took them out of the olive tree and he grafted us in. We're so special. No. Neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And how does faith come in? Faith is love of the law. As we said before, it's not enough. To admit that you're unable to perform that which God commands of you. You must understand that what he commands of you, he should command. That's the love of the law. Faith is the love of the law driving us to Christ's propitiation. And deliverance from our enemy on the right. Deliverance from the guilt of sin. Faith is love of the law reconciling us subjectively to obedience and deliverance from the dominion of sin. And so we see, in conclusion, God saves his people through the destruction of the wicked. There was a physical manifestation in Samson and the Old Testament. He killed physical Philistines, but it was a spiritual battle. God saves his people through the destruction of the wicked. Because in the New Testament, we're left with only the spiritual aspect of our warfare. And so lastly, we just want to mention a few things regarding this concept that our warfare is and always has been a spiritual warfare. What is the last point of Tula? We know that it is T-U-L-I-P and the P stands for perseverance. But have you noticed this, that more and more and more Calvinists love to say that the, per, the P doesn't stand for perseverance. It stands for preservation, which is true. Preservation of the saints. We persevere because God preserves us. It is the work of God that preserves us. At the same time, I much prefer perseverance. Why? Because this is a warfare. 1 John 5, 4. Once again, this is the victory 
that overcometh the world. Even our faith. We're back to 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Are not of the natural realm. That's disappeared. But mighty. They're spiritual. John 8, 26. Listen to the words of our Lord himself. Meditate on this for the rest of your life. John 18, 26. Thirty-six, excuse me. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then, I, then would my servants fight physically that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. It's a spiritual warfare. And as we looked at 2 Corinthians 10, 4, let's look at the third verse before we get to verses 4 and 5. In 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh. Once again, this is not talking about the carnal mind is enmity, that concept. No. We walk in the natural realm. As Paul says, our outward man is perishing. This natural realm, this physical body that we have, we walk in the natural realm. We do not war after the flesh. We're presuppositionalists, not evidentialists. You see that? An evidentialist is a person who wars after the flesh. Well, Romans 8. Verse 37. We're using these verses to show just how prevalent this is throughout the entire Bible, especially the New Testament, because we must understand that we are, number one, we're in a war, but it's a spiritual war. And in all these things, we're more than conquerors. To conquer, you have to conquer something. There must be an object of your conquering through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, all those things are potential conquerors of us, but which we must and do conquer through the faith which God gives us and which God gave Samson. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. See that? We fight through faith as Samson did. And once he got his hair cut off, he was grinding at the mill, and yet, you could imagine how his faith, though it was stunted by his unbelief, it grew and grew and grew in that prison house. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many. The good fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. A fight that is fought through the method of faith which God gives us as he gave Samson. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time together. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee that though we are in a war to the death and it will never let up, Thou hast given us the wherewithal to fight our enemies. Not only to fight our enemies, but as in the case of Samson, 
Though we do not kill them physically, we most certainly destroy them through the faith which thou dost give us, through the word which is the sword of the Spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.